Ready? Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Michael Ducey, uh, and I'm here to, well, first I'm going to move this table just a bit so I can walk. Uh, so I'm going to talk about something called uh, the goat in the silo and beyond the goat in the silo. So this is a little bit of a, um, as we say in English, tongue-in-cheek of a talk, so a little bit of hopefully uh, laughs to wake you up or uh, many groans to put you to sleep. Uh, it depends upon how it goes. But this is a talk that I uh, gave originally five years ago, and so it was kind of interesting to open it back up and dig into it and see how the world is dev of DevOps has changed over those last five years. So uh, you're probably asking yourselves, uh, you know, what the hell or what the F uh, are we about to talk about? Why do we have someone up here that's going to talk to me about goats and how they apply to DevOps? So there's a mathematical problem that says a goat is tied to a silo of radius x with rope of length y. What is the grazing area of the goat? And so uh, since the tether is pinned to a certain point on the silo, uh, it's, only, it's not going to make a complete circle. It's going to be an odd-shaped circle. So it's kind of a common uh, one of those problems to teach calculus that they often give. Uh, and so usually the first question that I get after uh, I propose this as a topic for a talk is this, uh, have you lost your mind? And the answer, of course, is always maybe. Uh, I guess that's always kind of in the eye of the beholder or not. Uh, so let's talk about silos real quick. So um, does the term organizational silos something that translates over well? Uh, so you have these groups, and these groups perform certain actions in your organization. And typically what we've done is uh, at least when we did IT originally, we would organize in silos around the operating system and systems engineering and systems administration and the database administrators and all of those sorts of things as well. And in the early days of DevOps, there was a very loud cry of, you know, Mr. Uh, IT manager, tear down this silo, right? Uh, of course, you know, Reagan's speech in front of the Berlin Wall, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. And so, it's kind of important to understand that as we made this cry that we want to tear down our silos, we're actually asking for something very much, uh, something very particular. And what we're asking for is we want to tear down our organizational structure because silos are just a reflection of how we've decided to organize ourselves and how we decided to organize ourselves around our work. And I think more importantly is that silos are a reflection of the IT manufacturing process. So we put processes in place about how we were going to create this IT thing that we were creating, whether for deploying an application or whether for standing up new infrastructure or whatever we might be doing. And this is just a manufacturing process that we created. And so it, what's really important to understand is that we've talked about for the last five or six years in the world of DevOps about how you can start to apply I, uh, manufacturing processes and manufacturing processing improvements to the world of IT. And one of those things that we talked about a lot uh, early on, and still a lot of organizations that are going through DevOps transformation will talk about this, is something called value stream mapping. So this is a manufacturing process. Uh, I think it's a manufacturing process for uh, building bikes or bikes, bicycle frames. Uh, and what is really telling about this is you can start to see where the time is spent from a work perspective, right? So if we went and looked at, if we changed the labels on this uh, to more IT-centric labels, you can see there that it takes about two minutes worth of work for the operating system people to create the operating system in the machine, and then it takes 10 days before the application team has time to get around to it to deploy the application. Uh, it takes four minutes to deploy the application, and then, of course, it takes 15 days before you can move it on to the database team, eight days before you can move it on to the security team, and so forth. And all in all, we end up spending 30 days just to get a machine out, right? Of course, nobody's IT organizations are like this anymore, right? Right? Hopefully not. Hopefully you're using some form of automation by now. But if we reflect back to where we were at five years ago, uh, this was a really important concept because automation wasn't as prevalent as it was uh, as it is today. So now that we've kind of talked about silos, let's talk about goats a little bit. Uh, so goats are very, very interesting animals. So uh, they have lots of traits about them that make them somewhat unique uh, compared to other animals. 
Uh, they're a fairly smart animal, and they're also very curious. And so because they're very curious, they're always getting themselves into trouble somehow. Uh, if you put a barrier in front of a goat, uh, and like say if there's something like water on the other side of the barrier, uh, now the goat is smart, but not necessarily that smart, because they'll just try to go through the barrier and try to find ways, instead of trying to find ways around the barrier. Uh, and there, the fence could be open on either side, and the goat's still just going to try to keep going through that fence until it gets through it. Uh, so while they're curious, they're not always, you know, look at the entire strategy of how they could actually achieve their goals. Uh, they can be used for a multitude of things. Uh, so they can haul your kids around. Uh, this is actually a picture of my grandmother. No, it's not. Uh, <laughs> They can also be used to haul other livestock around as well. So uh, it's a common thing that roosters like to ride on the back of goats. Uh, I'm not sure why. I've tried to research this and find out why. Uh, but there's just this natural attraction between the two. Uh, now, apologies to any vegetarians in the room. Uh, but they can also make a, a tasty stew as well. Uh, and then in a lot of developing nations, goats are given uh, as part of an aid uh, uh, aid that you can give to um, these, these developing nations because goats can provide a lot of different resources. So they can provide uh, milk in the form of food. They can provide grazing and uh, manure and other things like that for planting crops uh, as well. They also make uh, a great fashion statement. Uh, and then they also have this unique thing is that they'll eat a lot of stuff. So um, there's a little bit of a myth that a goat will eat anything. Uh, but a goat doesn't necessarily, uh, isn't necessarily trying to eat that object always. Uh, so if a goat puts a, uh, a can in its mouth, uh, what it's actually doing is because it doesn't have hands and opposable thumbs and can't pick it up, what it's doing is, is it's using its mouth to actually go and explore the object, much like a young baby would be doing uh, as well. And there's actually services that you can go and rent goats to do grazing for you. Um, funny story, recently in uh, one of the states, um, one of the United States, I forget which one, but this company actually had an incident where somebody had rented their goats, and this whole herd of like 100 goats got out, and is just roaming through this, uh, through this neighborhood uh, in this urban, urban area. Uh, but they're, they're very common, you can use these goats to clear areas, and it's a more eco-friendly way, instead of using lawnmowers and other things like that as well. So I like to think of some ideas that we've talked about for a while uh, in the world of DevOps and kind of put that into the context of GOATS. So we've had these ideas of full stack developers for a long time. So someone who started off as a developer that has started to work their way more into the operations world, understands how to deploy the application, understands how to deploy cloud infrastructure and so forth. Uh, and then you have this concept of full stack operations as well. And so these full stack operations people are maybe somebody uh, who started off in the operations world, working on infrastructure and deploying cloud infrastructure and so forth. And they've slowly worked their way back through having to help with deploys and other things like that to where they can actually start writing code. Now let's tie this back together with this original idea of the goat and the silo. So this is what the diagram would look like. Uh, so you have the silo there, the circle uh, in the middle. You can see the red line is the tether. And this would be the grazing area of the goat. So when I originally kind of put this together, I kind of thought about how do we start to build these people that are more full stack operations, full stack developers, and have uh, maybe specializ specialization in one area, but generalization in other areas so that they could start to understand the entire problem a little bit more. And if you start to think about what that IT chain looks like, uh, what ends up happening is, is the reason why you don't have these people who are full stack is because the communication paths and the feedback loops uh, are such that uh, the OS people only ever talk to the application people. The application people only ever talk to the database people. Uh, the security team might circle back and talk to these people at some point, or they just might put a roadblock in the way to prevent something from going forward. Uh, and eventually, the business or the end user are the ones who are going to start getting back the information. And hopefully, there's a way for that to feed back into the entire development process at some point. So the interesting thing is about GOATs. Um, and so if we can start to build this, how do we start to talk to more people in our organization? And uh, for the longest time in the world of DevOps, we've had this idea of cross-functional teams. So I, how do I build a team 
uh, where I have all of these people embedded inside of that team so that they can share information and you can respond more quickly to your peers' needs. And then, of course, development would be part of this as well. And these people setting up with the developers to actually develop what they need to actually deploy the application in a fast and efficient manner. And so if you start to build this culture of having people that specialize in one thing but generalize in another, and you build these cross-functional teams, well, what happens when you start to have animals that live together? You have more animals eventually, right? And so the idea is, is that eventually what you want to have is something that looks like this, where you're building this culture of learning, uh, this culture of generalization and specialization to where you can start to work with other people in these cross-functional teams and start to share information across these cross-functional teams. And that's the whole concept of goats and silos and how do you get people in your organization out of their silos so they can start to learn more and become more generalist than other areas while maintaining that area of specialization. So if you start to think about silos and start to think about the problem that I'm kind of putting forth around silos, is that the silos are just a reflection of the manufacturing process that we have in place. And so the problem that we've come to realize is that the silos aren't necessarily the problem. It's how the silos are able to move things from one area to the other. And so uh, don't hate the silo, but hate the grain elevator. So this is a grain elevator. This is uh, just a series of silos. Nothing moves between these two. And this is what we've kind of had in traditional IT. But then when you start to put some automation on top of it, you have all these different silos where you can easily move grain from one silo to the other. You can easily load it onto a train car. You can easily take it off of the trucks that bring it into the grain elevator. You can sort it. You can do all sorts of stuff with it. And this is what we've kind of been on in the journey uh, of DevOps for the last five or six years, is this idea of how do we optimize the grain elevator. So let's talk about where we've gone uh, five years on, where we've gone. Uh, I didn't mean for that to rhyme, but I'm glad it did. So in the last five years, we've seen uh, two implementations of DevOps really come about. Uh, so there's the uh, DevOps team or DevOps engineer, um, which I found a nice goat hammer, which is kind of you know what a DevOps team has to do from time to time is just hammer the nail in. Uh, there's, this, uh, there's a saying in English is that when you only have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Uh, so that's sometimes what the DevOps team has to do. And then there are site reliability engineering or SREs, which are in some ways kind of the Swiss army knife uh, of operations these days. So let me kind of go back to this idea of these different teams and specialization and talk about how these things have evolved over the last several years. So the DevOps team tends to take on uh, systems administrator responsibilities. So uh, you might hear people uh, complain from time to time is like, I've been doing this work for uh, 15 years and we just called it systems administration and I was happy with that. Why do we have to now be DevOps engineers? So the things that have changed that make it no longer just uh, systems administration is a lot of the release engineering jobs and tasks have started to move into the world of systems administrators. And we've got this idea that we're starting to build automation into the applications and the infrastructure. Uh, and then there's also an area of responsibility, another higher level of abstraction of automation when it comes to our CI and CD pipelines and how do we actually build the software and make the artifact that we can deploy onto that infrastructure. And so the DevOps engineer and DevOps teams really take on this area of responsibility uh, from what I've seen in organizations. Now you have site reliability engineers, and they kind of come after the process of the DevOps team helping the developers actually ship their code out. And these are the people in your organization that focus on running reliable systems, so they're more focused about how the application's actually going to behave in production. They're focused on much lower level problems, uh, where the DevOps engineers tend to focus on how do I release this application and how do I get it out as quickly as possible. The site reliability engineers are going to be looking at things of like, why does my SQL perform badly on this particular instance type in uh, EC2 or my particular cloud provider? They're going to get into low-level problems inside of the actual code base, uh, maybe going as low-level as drivers and that low-level on the, on the actual kernel itself, uh, or maybe staying a couple of steps higher. But they're the really the experts that can go deep. 
And they also implement these things called standards or SLOs for production readiness. So they tell the DevOps engineers and the developers that their application needs to have these properties so that I can run it and manage it in a highly scalable way. So making sure that uh, things like monitoring are built into the application, uh, making sure that there are circuit breakers and other things like that so you can turn off parts of the application if one starts to fail, uh, having things like back off uh, built into the application as well. So if an application is down, you're not going to queue up a bunch of requests and things like that. And it feeds back failure into the organization. And so um, one thing that's really important, and this is still true today as it was uh, nine years ago when the concept of DevOps really got started, is that feeding failure back into the organization is really important. So learning about how the application didn't run correctly in production, and how can we avoid that with the next application that we're going to deploy? And what learnings can we take from that when we go to go and deploy the next application? And so what we end up with is something that looks like a supply chain like this now. Uh, and so we have uh, the developers who work closely with the DevOps team. And I would like to think that the DevOps team actually builds the tools that make the developers productive. So uh, they're almost kind of like a developer experience, developer uh, evangelist type role or developer advocate type role in your organization to give the tools that the developers need to actually deploy the applications. And then you have the SREs who are the ones who are actually responsible for running the application and feeding back in the failures into the organization. Now, on the other end, you have the end user, and the SREs are also really responsible for pulling a lot of the metrics from the end user side of things as well, and to detect failures and other things like that as well. So what we've had, though, is a problem over the years is that um, uh, I don't know if anyone's ever heard around uh, a security person being like, why am I not included in DevOps? It's just Dev and Ops, but I should be a, have a seat at the table, right? And so we've heard a lot of those moanings over the last several years in the world of DevOps. And it mainly comes from the security people and the compliance people. And so what a lot of organizations have tried to do, or kind of the industry as a whole has tried to do, at least some people, have tried to wedge this thing in between developers and op, uh, the DevOps team to call this thing called DevSecOps. So how do I start to begin building in security principles and how do I deploy software? So essentially, almost wedging in another silo into this manufacturing chain. Uh, you also have the business who have requirements that they're constantly shipping into, uh, into uh, the organization or into this pipeline, uh, this grain elevator, if you will. You have things like management teams and leadership teams that want to know why the application isn't moving or why is this work that we're doing on these Jenkins pipelines, how is that going to affect my bottom line? Uh, asking questions about why are we doing things like SRE and DevOps and how they're different. How do I begin to hire for those people as well? And so you start to have HR that gets involved in the conversation as well of like, how do I staff this team? How do I build these cross-functional teams? What are the things that I should be looking for from a talent perspective as well? And what we've almost ended up doing is we've almost ended up creating yet another silo, right? Uh, in this middle ground of the DevOps team absorbing all of this other work and then having the SRE team as well and having this very tight feedback loop. But what we forgot to do in the process is we forgot to do include a lot of these other people on the periphery and include them as part of the overall process. So what we end up with is a bunch of DevOps engineers behind their fence uh, doing their work, and then we constantly have people peering over wondering what we're doing, why we're doing it, uh, occasionally, from time to time, we have people from different organizations that just peek their head in, uh, get a little bit about what we're doing, and then go out of uh, the organization again, or go out of the DevOps team and leave them alone. Uh, and then you have some people in the organization that are just trying to jump the fence entirely. Uh, and, they want, and that could be because they're hungry and they want to see what this other team is doing, and how can we expand this out to the broader organization. Uh, and they're trying to get in on the party. So let's go through this a little bit, uh, kind of, uh, of what we've done over the last couple of years uh, and talk about some of the problems and solutions. So one question I'll ask is, why do we love silos so much? So we tend to do this so much is that we organize ourselves around like-minded people. We organize ourselves around people that we can have a conversation with uh, that speak the same language as me, uh, not necessarily language uh, like English or Serbian, but in, uh, the, the nomenclature that we use. So if you start having a conversation with somebody who's on the front end team and you're somebody who just does 
you know, cloud infrastructure deployments, uh, a lot of the terms they start using you won't understand and you'll tune out of the conversation and you may not necessarily want to learn more. The other thing that we do is we tend to locally optimize. So this is a pure local optimization is that we've kind of optimized the middle and we optimize the thing that is easy. Uh, we optimize the technology. So we've made this grain elevator a lot better. And we made this grain elevator a lot better by rubbing on it things like Kubernetes and Chef or Ansible, uh, Jenkins, Docker, and so forth. And so we've been able to get a lot of improvements in the world of DevOps by going through and optimizing this grain elevator. But at a certain point when you do a local optimization is that you're going to find that you have a bottleneck in another place. And that's what kind of what we're finding in the world of DevOps is that as this world starts to shift, how do we make this go even faster? And so that kind of goes back to a, uh, a thing that uh, is uh, a phrase that's common in the world of capacity and performance management is that you never remove a bottleneck, you simply move it. And so as we did that local, uh, local optimization around the DevOps team and the SRE teams, uh, we now have just shifted that bottleneck away from them into other parts of the organization. So another thing that I want to kind of emphasize is that uh, despite its name uh, and despite the origins of its name, very quickly DevOps uh, morphed into being something more than just talking about development and operations. So DevOps was never about just Dev and Ops. So when people come to you and, have, uh, and make those statements about why wasn't security involved in DevOps? And it's like, well, it, it was an open community that anyone can walk up to the table to and participate in, and that's what was always encouraged. And there's some really good definitions that I like to kind of go back to as foundational components to just kind of remember and level set where we should be in this conversation. So one is a really good one by Adam Jacob, the CTO of Chef. Um, so DevOps is a cultural and professional movement focused on how we build and operate high velocity organizations born from the enterprises of its practitioners. I think the really key thing is, is that it's not high velocity technology organizations, it's not high velocity DevOps teams, it's not high velocity SREs, it's high velocity organizations as a whole. It's not just individual components and those local optimizations. And so that's an important thing to really think about is, are we building a high velocity organization or are we just building a local optimization with my DevOps team? Uh, another definition from early on in the world of DevOps that I think is still applicable and you can still begin to uh, still go back to, to kind of get a baseline of what you should be thinking about. So uh, there's something called comms, uh, which was coined by a number of gentlemen uh, and it really focuses on this idea of culture. So the culture of the organization matters. Uh, automation and trying to automate everything, and we've done a really good job of this over the last five years. Uh, things like containers have made this process much easier uh, as well. Uh, are we focusing on lean and removing waste from the system? Are we doing processes that we could be automating? Uh, it, are we building those future state maps still? and seeing what that future state map is with uh, value stream mapping to see how can I begin to remove even more waste from my organization and my processes. Uh, are we measuring everything so that the SRE teams can respond to it in the way that we want them to? And then are we sharing both in our organization between teams and making sure that the goats are going out and interacting with other silos, that we have cross-functional teams uh, and people are sharing information and so forth. And the culture bit is I think the one that we've missed the most. And the reason why I think that we miss the culture one the most over the last five years is because technology is easy, people are hard, right? Uh, and learning how to interact with your peers in a different way that you've been interacting with them for the last 10 years is hard. Uh, there's a lot of people in your organization that say, we've been doing this, this, this way for the last 10 years, I don't see why we need to change. And those conversations are much harder to have versus, uh, hey, I need to name this variable uh, foo. Uh, and, I, and we're going to rename it from foobar because we just need a shorter variable name or something like that, right? And no one's going to care and the pull request goes through and you never probably had to talk to a person actually in that entire process. And so what's really key about that though is you might have this DevOps strategy in your organization and how you're going to go and automate anything, but the really key point is that culture constrains strategy. Another way that uh, commonly is used to say this is that culture eats strategy for breakfast. Uh, so if you don't have the culture in place, the strategy is not going to be successful and DevOps is definitely one of those things where you need to have the culture in place. 
And then lastly, there's something called Conway's Law. Uh, Conway's Law talks about organization and communication patterns and how we tend to organize ourselves. Uh, Mel Conway, uh, you can go to melconway.com. Uh, he's still uh, out there doing a lot of research in these areas. Uh, he's also on Twitter if you want to reach out to him, if you found anything that you've, uh, uh, that you've read of his useful. There's a bug. I need my chopsticks. Uh, so any organization that desi designs a system defined broadly will produce a design whose structure is a copy of the organization's communication structure. So basically what this means is that your architecture diagram is probably going to look like your org chart, right? And also when you think about this, uh, and we talk about com communication patterns in organizations, is that if this is your microservices architecture, so uh, who from the front end gateway team, how many people are they going to talk to? They're going to talk to these people, these four people that are actually interacting with the front end gateway, and anybody on these third party teams. This person over here, or this team over here, is only going to interact with this team, this team, and then the front end gateway team. Somebody further back in the stack, uh, they'll probably only interface with one or two teams uh, in the organization. And so what ends up happening is, is that you end up losing these communication paths. You don't have a whole view of the entire system and how the entire system behaves, uh, which is why things like uh, what SREs are doing around complex distributed systems and things like that as well, and that whole practice coming in is very important. But it kind of goes back to the local optimization that we made, is that we made this local optimization that focused on these very, very small communication paths that we're going to be having in our organization versus the commun communication paths that you actually wanted to have in the organization. So um, maybe we named it Dev and Ops, and people weren't necessarily receptive on the security team to going and having those conversations. Fair enough point. But the really important thing is, is how now can we start to build these cross-functional teams that really matter? And so cross-functional teams are about communication patterns and feedback loops. They're not about your proximity of where you sit next to someone, right? You can have cross-functional teams that could be fully remote people uh, that are working on this cross-functional teams. But the important thing is that you're sharing information about what you're doing and your role in that application that you're developing or that product that you're creating. Uh, and then when something doesn't work right in one of their pieces of code or one of their applications or anything like that, you have that feedback loop to learn more uh, about how you can make what you're doing better. And without that feedback loop, you can't improve anything. Um, and that's a really, really key point of lean and lean manufacturing is having those feedback loops so that you can learn what you're doing to reduce re rework and other things like that as well. So uh, in summary, uh, DevOps has come a long way in the last nine years, uh, going to that diagram where you have the operating system team and the application team and the database team and the security team. We do still have some of that in organizations, but they're organized a little bit differently. Uh, a lot of the roles have changed in organizations as well. Uh, but I honestly feel like in the next nine years of DevOps, if it's still around, is that we need to focus on removing those local optimizations or not necessarily removing the local optimizations, but learning how we can optimize around those local optimizations to optimize the entire organization. Uh, I think we should refocus our efforts on culture and continue to have those conversations around culture and how organizational culture is really important to the health uh, and well-being of the employees uh, and the people in your organization, uh, not only uh, how fast can we ship code uh, in building a successful business. Uh, we need to ensure that cross-functional teams are cr truly cross-functional. So if you have a DevOps team, you probably have created another silo. Uh, if you have an SRE team, you might have created another silo as well. How can you then go and take those silos that you've created and making sure that they're interacting with the broader part of the organization? Uh, so with that, thank you very much. Uh, we're just about with time, but I'll be mingling around if anyone has any questions. Uh, one other bit. Uh, I work at Sysdig. Uh, we are hiring. We have an office in Belgrade. We have about six openings for uh, QA, some DevOps engineers, uh, and then engineering as well. Uh, so check out our jobs page. But uh, thank you.